Welcome to the Parkinson's Podcast Unfiltered with hosts Heather Kennedy and Kat Hill, brought to you by the Davis Finney Foundation. Heather is originally from New York and was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's in 2011 when she was 40. Kat is originally from a small town in California and was diagnosed in 2015 when she was 48. Heather and Kat have been friends since they met at the World Parkinson Congress in 2019. In each episode, Heather and Kat dive deep into the raw emotions and realities of life with Parkinson's. Hey, Heather. Kat Hill, you are a sight for sore eyes. My friend. Why are we friends? How did we meet? You met my wonderful um, husband first. <laughs> yeah, but where were we at the WPC, the World Parkinson's Congress? That's right. What so I had to get a disease to meet you? Yeah, right? <sighs> That's all. Almost, almost worth it. Almost, almost. <laughs> so what brings people together? You know, there are, there are common interests, usually activities. Mm-hmm. So what happens when those relationships change mm. when a chronic illness is present? It's a great question, Heather. And I love that we're following our last conversation, which was mm-hmm. about curating our lives with the things in them, right? Mm-hmm. And I like that we're talking this time about how we curate our lives with the people in them mm-hmm. and how that changes over time. It changes with age. It changes with stage of life. But it also changes with this disease process. How has it changed for you recently, Heather? You know, recently, and I've always done the part where I use a a different template for each person. I try not to foist my template onto you or all the other people with Parkinson's or other people in my world, because not everyone is having the same experience. Mm -hmm. And my template does not work for you. For example... One thing I've really come across lately more than ever is I'd say something like, I wouldn't do that, you know, or who does that, right? It doesn't matter if I would do it. It doesn't mean the same thing if someone else does it that way. In other words, I allow some space for the person to do what they're going to do because I'm not a mind reader. I have no idea what you're going through unless you share it. And even then sometimes, have you noticed that sometimes even when somebody shares their experience, Mm -hmm. we can't really know, right? Right. And I think having been in a long-term, relatively happy marriage for, gosh, a while, 34 years, it's part of what you learn even with a partner that you know very well. You may assume you know what they're thinking, but I still am surprised. Very often, I am surprised. Yes, to recognize the complexity, to recognize the layers, to recognize that we may be from different cultures, we may be different genders, we may be different. How about this? When you know someone's currency, Mm -hmm. you think you know so much about them. Currency Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be material. It could be connection. It could be love with a big L as in action, service to others. Mm -hmm. What makes one person a little more empathic than another? What would make someone stay when things are going downhill as in a chronic, incurable, progressive neurological disease? Why do some partners stay and others leave? And we know that partners that are dealing with chronic illness, both in their partners themselves, but also in their children, we know that those marriages Mm -hmm. are more at risk than the everyday Mm -hmm. population. And the everyday population only makes it 50% of the time. You know, I wish I could figure out the secret sauce, right? Or share a secret sauce. For me, it comes back to being, or for Ken and I and our family, it comes back to good communication and communicating, especially when things are hard and learning both how I deal with hard things and how the people in my life deals with hard things. But we do talk about it. And I think relationships that make it have better foundations for what to do in hard times. So... To discuss things like religion or politics or social issues or boundaries or what you want from your family, like do you want to have a family? Or things people used to discuss in something called pre cana I'm sure that still exists for the Catholics in our world, and I'm not recommending it. However, I am recommending 
asking blunt questions. Mm -hmm. What is your view of monogamy? Right. And knowing how you'd answer it yourself. Right. Right. Not just being willing to ask the questions, but being willing to answer and be honest about how you would answer. Right. I find myself wanting to protect people from Parkinson's now. We were looking at some studies. One was in Holland. 66% of caregivers were women. And it says 63 were men. Now, that's not an even 100%. By any mm -hmm. <laughs> However, I feel like it's different than that. I feel like most of the caregivers are women. And I will say, from my experience, just from the small amount of people that I know really well in the Parkinson's community, the men do not want to ask for help. They feel a little, you know, eviscerated or infantilized sometimes, mm -hmm. but they have to have the help. And women do tend to stay more often. What do you think of my unofficial, unscientific, you know, conclusion? Heather, I think that's pretty right on. And I think the difference between Holland and the U.S. is significant. Talk about a difference in mm. culture. I think that women traditionally... And I do believe it's changing, but traditionally are the folks that access health care in families. Statistically, that still bears out. I know that men historically in the U.S. were were the breadwinners, right? They were the ones who made the money and accessed the banks and the credit cards and all of that stuff. A lot of pressure came with that also. And in the U.S., it's very valued for us to be independent. And so that was partly how success was shown. I do believe these gender biases are slowly changing. But with all cultures, it's slow to change. And so inherent in that is asking for help is hard. It's hard for men. It's hard for women. I think historically it's been harder for men. It's been less acceptable for men to ask for help. And so how do we do that? And how do we even ourselves ask for help? I'm terrible at it. I'm mm -hmm. the worst patient in my house. I've been told the same. Yes. I had a friend text me the other night, you are a terrible patient. Mm -hmm. I do not like being around you when you're off because you're so hard on yourself. You are so belligerent that you won't ask for help unless you're already on the floor mm -hmm. and completely can't move like it's too late by then. But back to what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the As a person with PD loses function, a number of things could be happening with the patient, right? Or the person with PD. And then the stress on the relationship can have a a situation where the partner becomes depressed, they feel a little trapped too. So this communication you mentioned, what if we all had enough resources to hire someone to come in to alleviate that? Mm -hmm. What an amazing world that would be if we could communicate that, look, I don't want you to always be my carer. I want to leave some mystery in there. Yeah, I think it's a complex issue, Heather. I think it mm -hmm. is a socio-cultural issue issue yes. about us wanting to allow others in our home for us. How, how do we right size? How do we have mm -hmm. adequate access to resources to support caregivers, care helpers, care partners, and those with chronic disease? So I think it's a complex issue. I don't think we're going to solve it today. I'm sad to say. Mm -hmm. I wish I had something concrete to offer, but I think I hope for listeners, they realize that they aren't alone. And I think being able to reach out for what resources there are. There are local, regional, national, international organizations like the Davis Finney Foundation who have resources to help support folks that feel isolated or alone. The other thing I think I would really love to share for those that are struggling with either new diagnosis or new change in symptoms, that it's important to curate and tend to one's relationships by allowing some time to talk about the changes. And even if that's hard, and knowing that both the carer and the person with Parkinson's or whatever disease challenge you're facing have different needs and both need to be honored in the process. One thing that struck me while listening to you talk about that is, the ability for some partners or friends or coworkers to acknowledge the chemical storm that's going on in someone when it's neurological. Talk about the intersection of ADD and Parkinson's and moving and 
paperwork from the lawyer and the kids changing, giving up my dog and cat and saying goodbye to everybody on the oh. coast and moving across the country, it would be a very strange time to start a relationship. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but the thing is, it's really confusing to people. I had a friend say, I'm going to stop by. And then when I didn't get right back to that friend, they kind of said, you were, you're so chatty this morning and you disappeared. Well, I was working with someone nonstop carrying things, literally didn't have the phone. And I left the phone in one of the boxes and it went away in the truck. Mm. Had to get it back like it in the middle of the night. Right. Anyway, my, my point is we don't have the uh, capability of communicating in the same ways as this disease progresses, nor, nor, would, nor does anyone. As we grow older, let's talk about the difference between Gen X and millennials. You don't communicate the same way. I think it's a complex issue, too, because I want to get back to a little bit to our curating talk, yes, right? Yes. When you have less energy, how do you decide where you're going to put it? Right now, Heather, you've got enormous energy going out to make this move happen. You're needing to put out probably more than you even have. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And so you're having to make decisions about what's right in front of you and, and probably don't have the energy to be thinking curation, right? I wanted to add right here in the middle of this thought that you're having. I have to mm -hmm. train people to help me because I don't want to bother my friends. So I'm training strangers who are coming in last minute during this time. Mm -hmm. And back to what you're saying. Right. So that takes a level of energy, sort of that training, right? And so that's energy that you might not have to then put into tending to a friendship or getting back on time. And I think our friends and our family are so well-intentioned in this. They're not walking in our Parkinson's shoes. Not all of them. I have a few that are, but it is important to remember that they can't know what's going on in our heads. They can't be mind readers. And we have to learn to change our expectations a little bit about what they're going through. And also realizing that like for my contemporaries, I loved the group of midwives I worked with, Lo loved them. I genuinely love and I still love these women. But those that were at the same age and stage as I was, they're still putting in full time plus hours catching babies working hard with families and they don't have a lot of downtime. And when right. they have downtime, I don't, I'm done for the day. So of course those relationships are going to change and go by the wayside for a season. And that's okay. It's yeah. okay to be sad about that. It's okay to mourn that. Right. And also I have to curate how much time I put out here. Partly why you and I decided to do this podcast is because we love hanging out together. Mm -hmm. And we thought that maybe we could be of service while we did it. Maybe just a little. <laughs> Full disclosure. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Kat, you are just a beam of light. You're such a good girlfriend, too. You have a lot of very deep relationships with your sisters. And I will say, it does take work. You show up, you're present, even when you're really hurting, I've been on the phone with you. You've had a million things going on, but you'll stop, look and listen, you know, to really be present and give yourself the opportunity to give somebody attention it requires us to curate a lot and edit down. I don't have a lot of friends. I don't have large groups anymore. I have a few very good friends, mm -hmm. just a few. And then I have rings of acquaintances and other types of friends. Well, Heather, your check is in the mail again. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. You are too kind. And what I will say is that I'm learning too. I used to love big groups of people, and I know you did too. Going out, dancing, oh. loud music, the whole thing. Have I you seen just, my twerk? I think I may have actually. <laughs> it's for everybody, ready? It's the Parkinson's twerk, which is have to way better. It, ready? Okay, there we go. There she goes. She's she's moving a little. Her hands are Everything out. Everything but the butt is moving. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Is it supposed to be the other way? <laughs> I think it is, Heather. Even my nose is moving. My glasses are falling off. <laughs> I was just going to say, her butt's... glasses are moving, but not much mm -hmm. else is. <laughs> oh, friend. So Awkward. 
Mm, awkward the twerk on podcast narrated by the midwife i don't know i think this is an epic fail Heather, I yeah, do. Me too. We're, we're not we're not those people i'm we're not gonna not pretend i'm so not hip i would get kicked out of williamsburg <laughs> green point if i was back there now oh but here's what i really want to say in terms of curation you yeah. only have so much time in a day so much energy all the petty stuff is gone i forgive a lot easier now than i used to Mm-hmm. I would hold someone's feet over the fire for mm-hmm. something that didn't matter. Now I can't even remember what those things were about. I would call people mm-hmm. recently to say goodbye. People who I thought were mad at me. Mm-hmm. And I would just say, I'm sorry for some of the things that I've done when I was hungry. But these agonists do cause some impulsivity. So, oh, can we return to that one part that you were saying about the different, when you're yeah. with your partner and you first find out. Mm-hmm. And there are many who have gotten married or partnered or became friends with the person already having Parkinson's, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like you meet somebody, the love of your life. You, you know, you go off and get married. There's tin cans in the back of the car and, you know, rice is thrown at you, the whole tradition thing. You have this idea of how things are going to go. This ain't it. No. So there we are and we get it. And I don't know about you, but I was sort of even more manic when I first got it. I was like, I got this. I'm jazz hands. I was so obnoxious because I was on agonist. And my disease had not progressed yet. And I thought, what's the big deal? I can handle this. A little bit like Alan Alda said in his um, famed interview. And I felt like saying, don't talk yet, Alan, because you just wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, so I looked to Davis. I looked to John Stamford. I looked to Gene Burns and some people who had it for a while. Try to follow their lead, like Vicki Dillon in the UK. Right. Our Parkinson's heroes. Yeah, yeah. I love you. Oh, I'm following you. Mm, no, babe. Well, <laughs> I guess I it's mutual. <laughs> all I remember is that I feel lucky to have been humbled by this disease. I didn't come here on my own volition. In other words, I didn't get humbled and more, more spiritual and more into prayer and contemplative life and writing and being in service by choice. Mm-hmm. I just can't go to the club anymore and be the big swaggery ego that I used to be. It's not an option. Mm-hmm. Now I kind of go. Mm-hmm. And so I can fill my time doing more important things like hanging out with you. It's so great. I, I feel like this has been a real gift for me. And I think it's been a gift in this new stage I'm entering into more in this, you know, this 10 year mark of diagnosis mm-hmm. and probably 20 ish year marks since first symptoms. I'm still mourning a bit the letting go of what I no longer can do or do well and accepting because I think I'm going to backtrack a second. I think I've been so caught up in not expecting disease progression, not assuming Mm -hmm. that everything is disease progression. Mm Because one of the traps is that we we're sitting waiting every second for something to progress and then we blame everything on Parkinson's. I've been trying to do the opposite. Ignore it until I'm fallen down almost. And then it's That's like, okay, I think this is here and this is staying and now I'm sad about it. Or I'm feeling some apathy and like, that's real. And that's the first time in my life I've ever not had a lot of passion. And it scared me, it threw me off balance. And acceptance and loss at each stage is a grief process. And as we move through and curating our lives, curating our relationships, that's new loss too. Letting go of some of the things that we no longer can do. I'm not going to go to the big rally dinner parties where there's a lot going on and a lot of people. Dinner time is a terrible time for me symptom wise. Some friends we all know go by the wayside because it's hard for them to see what Parkinson's brings us. And that's a loss. I also, like you, feel very, very blessed to have met some amazing people. And so like real life, right, there's trade-offs. And I think that staying connected as we feel smaller and smaller, having adequate support, reaching out. There, there's lots of support groups. There's online support groups. There are in-person support groups. There are webinars. There are podcasts. Yeah, um, stay connected. Staying connected. 
And for me, I'm doing less and less in person, Heather. I just am. And I'm mourning that loss. Mm -hmm. I'm mourning the fact that I don't have either the pie chart or the spoons to show up as much in person. I'm not speaking as much. I'm not accepting as many invitations. And that leaves more time for curation of the relationships that are most important to me. Mm -hmm. So I'll show up for you, friend, even if you're moving to the other coast. You know, we have so many opportunities to get together. If I can be in a place where care doesn't cost so much, where the standard of living is so different, you can Mm -hmm. get something for 200,000 there. Here, Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do about this this high cost of living because illness makes you poor. It causes Mm -hmm. poverty. It really does. It just guts you. I just tried this new medication. Mm -hmm. It's a form of carbolovidopa. It was $2,300. Wow. Wow. And if I didn't have health care, I wouldn't be even trying to get this. Mm-hmm. But it's the perfect way to take a medication that's not generic. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a perfect dose for me. And you've really struggled with taking generic forms of medicine. Mm-hmm. Knock on wood, that hasn't been a bridge that I've needed to cross yet. And hopefully I won't have that challenge. But we don't know, right? There's an example well, of something that would affect a relationship. My meds are off, but you can't always say, hey, sorry, my meds are off. Like that's just, it sounds dismissive to the other person. It affects my kids when they see me upset or anxious or Catherine says, I can't deal with your your attitude or your stress. And when I get breathless, when I'm trying to speak, sometimes people will assume I'm upset. It's just because I'm trying to get it in between the breath, Mm -hmm. but learning to be more quiet. I'm trying, not doing very well. (laughs) I get really excited talking to you. Here's a question. Mm -hmm. Since some relationships are strengthened by these challenges, what makes those people different than the people who would would weaken the relationship? The special sauce. Is it empathy though? Is it it compassion? Is it love? Yes. Loyalty? Yes. Identification and involvement with a larger PD community was Mm -hmm. a meaningful source of friendship and support. I have one friend that went to all the care meetings for me, just a friend, Mm. not a partner. Mm-hmm. Can I say her name? She's it's fine with amazing. me. Yes, her she's name is Nancy. Nancy, how's it mm. going? That's also a real nod to care partners aren't necessarily the people that we're married to or related to. It's right. it's they can be chosen family. And I do want to say that I know many are out there that are unpartnered, and and there are ways to seek support. And perhaps almost it's more important, right, that you lay some of that foundation for yourself and do it early. Don't wait until you need somebody to start curating your own relationships and your own stuff, right? So like we talked about last time, we don't want to leave it after we're dead. Swedish death cleaning has a uh, a place in this world. Right. Intentionally choosing who to spend your precious time with. Indeed. To experience the things that are important. I've read somewhere, and I don't know how they could possibly verify this. At the end of your life, you get a six or seven minute video that Mm. flashes in your mind as you're dying of Mm. all those special moments in your life. And many of them were just those small, quiet rooms, Mm -hmm. sitting next to someone, enjoying, gazing into their eyes, or the sound of the birds, or just sitting somewhere, holding hands, Mm -hmm. nothing big, or punching each other, depending upon what you're into, I guess. I mean, it could be anything. Or twerking. (laughs) twerking (laughs) by jumping up and down like you're doing jumping jacks only not moving your arms heather that's definitely gonna play on my six or seven minute video (laughs) was that (laughs) raise the roof it's on fire raise the roof raise the roof yeah ain't nobody want to see mama in the dance club anymore and so it was time i retired that and on the floor doing the wave never challenge a gay man to do the wave by the way on a dance floor Mm. he'll beat you I just want a club that has all those things at noon hour because I could still go for an hour right? if it were in the morning. <laughs> a dry club in the morning where we all dance and go crazy. Exactly. They have those in San Francisco. And karaoke. At yes. Noon. yes. It's always late. But yeah. And, you know, karaoke is a medicine for us. And so is dancing. Mm-hmm. We're not just popping off to have a conversation here about things we like. These are actual practical medicinal things that can't help us keep our voice 
yes. our breath work, Correct. our body, our movements, and our mood. Correct. Up, up. We have to communicate. We have to move. And we have to what show joy. Up. Well, aren't we lucky? We get to show up here and, and hopefully do this again and again. Can I speak to one thing, though, before I talk about how lucky we are? Yes. I've cried myself to sleep many nights. I've been bitter and angry and resentful that I have something. Meanwhile, my friends can walk. And I've had a friend tell me, gosh, I always feel so bad talking to you. Like, there's so much going on. And I want to tell you about my, my pain and what I'm going through, but I'm embarrassed to do so. That's why I don't call anymore. And I thought, yeah. So I try to maybe not share quite as much, even though I'm telling everyone to be more communicative. Maybe there's space to say, yeah, but that's what you're carrying. You get to have that just because I have Parkinson's. It doesn't have to take up all the air in the room. It doesn't have to be the giant monster. Mm -hmm. I can pull it back a little and say, get away from my friend. Let them have their time and share what they need to share. And I had a partner tell me the same thing. It was like everything was so tragic for you that I had no space to share my woes. Heather, you're a very good listener, though. And I think I think sometimes if we're having big stuff, we're also you and I are very verbal processors. So I think that we can take up all the air in a room at any given moment and just need to remember that we need to give space for others. And it's a good reminder. But I didn't get enough attention as a child. Oh, <laughs> sorry. What, what show is this? Yeah, I know it's true. Oh, yeah. blaming the parents. That's that's yeah. always my favorite, right? Friendship is a multi-directional experience, as our friend likes to say. Mm -hmm. And speaking of friends, I could write love letters to each of mine. This move has really shown me. People show up as much as they can. And moving's no fun. Nobody says, oh, I can't wait to help you move. I'll be right there. I like to lift things and <laughs> clean. And it's going to be so much fun. Nobody says that. It's well, love. you're you're loved, Heather. And you're, you're loved. been a, um, a role model for a lot of us and an inspiration to a lot of us. So I feel really blessed to be here today. And, and thanks again, Davis Finney Foundation for the opportunity to chat with you a little about curating in all of its unfiltered bliss. Yes. yes. Let's yeah. choose what we'll spend our attention and time on. Mm -hmm. Let's go quality. Yeah, let's try the high road. And and maybe I, a little twerking. Take the low road. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Parkinson's Podcast Unfiltered with Heather Kennedy and Cat Hill. For more information about the Davis Finney Foundation and to learn about educational offerings and community events for people affected by Parkinson's, please visit davisfinneyfoundation.org or dpf.org. This podcast includes information about Parkinson's and insights from our Parkinson's community. It is not intended as a substitute for treatment advice from your own medical providers.